All right. Hello, everyone. We're here. Um, not live today. <laughs> Normally, I do these live on Facebook. Um, but we're doing a uh, special uh, Zoom recording here. It's um, actually the day before I normally go live. To, it's uh, currently Wednesday, May 20th. Um, like I said, doing this a little bit here differently today. It's not just me talking to myself <laughs> like it normally is. Um, I'm here with Barbara <laughs> Handel. Handel. Did I say your last name? Barbara Handel. Handel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's a, um, well, I'll hear her tell you who she is. Um, Barbara, won't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so my name is Barbara Handel. I am a sex coach and my specialty is in BDSM. So I've been doing that for quite some time. And I studied at Sex Coach U. Also in college, I studied the psychology of human sexuality. And I've lectured at Glendale Community College and Ventura College um, about BDSM. And I, I absolutely love it. So, yeah. Yeah, very nice. What was, um, what was it like uh, going through Sex Coach U? What was that program like? Uh, really interesting. Yeah, it was really interesting, actually. It was, you know, online university and learning about uh, all the different sexual concerns and how to help my clients with them. And it's just a different approach than sex therapy, uh, which I actually really enjoyed. And so it combined the sexual concerns, how to help my clients, and the business aspect of it. It's just nonstop the most interesting like course that I think I've ever done so it was nice. it's really amazing yeah yeah it's very nice yeah that was one of the ones that um I was looking into when I was looking for a school and unfortunately the travel and everything I was really able to do it. and I'm happy before I went the education I got but you know it's, I would love also an opportunity of course to um maybe someday learn from Patty Britton because she's you know really well mm -hmm. in the industry and kind of been one of the earlier pioneers and you know written on the books and everything and is involved with all the organizations and everything so just you know it would, would be like a different perspective but um and i'm always curious to hear about uh people's experience who uh went through that program so yeah very nice so um see so yeah, i just got my list here so i kind of keep myself on track here <laughs> i always write things down because i just go by memory just you know who knows where we're gonna end up so uh, yeah so absolutely here. all right so just what i thought like there's uh, since you know the whole uh 50 shades phenomenon there's been maybe a little bit more you know bdsm bdsm has become a bit more mainstream to a degree where people maybe have a better idea of what it is and maybe what they did prior to that but of course you know i know a lot of people say and maybe you get to tell us your opinion about how uh, whether or not that was really the most accurate depiction of it, but just kind of you from someone, what just define it for us, what BDSM is in your, in your own terms. Yeah, so BDSM stands for um, bondage, um, it stands for, um, uh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, oh my gosh, I'm totally like spacing. Uh, so it's uh, bondage, <laughs> dominance, submission, sadism, and masochism, which is basically just the umbrella term. I mean, that's just what those words stand for, but there's so much more to it. Yeah. Um, it's definitely, it's really all about power dynamics. And if um, I can speak a little actually at the, about Fifty Shades of Grey um, and how the media portrayed it. So yes, you're right. It absolutely became more mainstream after that movie came out, like the whole world watched it. Unfortunately, it was a, a terrible portrayal of BDSM uh, in the sense that, you know, it really fed into the common um, misconceptions about BDSM. It portrayed it as abuse, um, that, you know, the contract that they signed, that does not always happen. It's, uh, it can be written, but I really haven't come across. In my six years of uh, practicing, I have rarely come across people, um, a dominant submissive who sign a contract. But if that's the way they want to do it, then of course, it's usually just spoken. But it didn't um, portray 
the beauty in the sense that submissives truly hold all of the power in it. Um, it, it the submissive sets the limits, um, uh, sets the boundaries, and that has to be respected at all times. And the dominant, you know, within the limits presented can take control in whatever their dynamic is. But, you know, it's like we have safe words, like submissives have safe words. Uh, usually it's uh, green, yellow, and red. That's a standard. Um, yellow means slow down. You need a drink of water. Your binds are too tight. And red just means stop completely. What was um, interesting and incredibly frustrating about the movie was at the very end of the first movie, she had asked um, Mr. Gray um, to uh, show her what punishment was like. And that's where it really got me because um, a huge thing in BDSM is that punishment, you don't just show what the punishment looks like. It's uh, talked about absolutely beforehand and punishment happens when a rule is broken um, or that's already been agreed upon and not severely it's usually you know when you get when the submissive gets used to the rules and if they truly break it that there's a punishment and that wasn't said or you know showed in the movie um mm -hmm. and that's where you know and i talk to a lot of i have friends who are vanilla which just means they're not in the bdsm community um and my friends in the bdsm community and and they all said yeah it looked like abuse um it looked horrible which is you know of course unfortunate because it's not Right. Um, and uh, also a common misconception for BDSM um, is masochists, which are people who are aroused by feeling pain, are that way because they were abused as children. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Right. They may have been abused in their lifetime, but that doesn't mean that they do this for that. I personally am a masochist and I was not abused as a child. It's, it's a release of endorphins that comes from that sense of pain mm -hmm. and uh so and actually bdsm in the curriculum um was considered um deviant behavior psychologically which mm -hmm. deviant behavior is along with pedophilia and bestiality and more recently it's now considered variant behavior which is not illegal or deviant but not normative which is right. you know vanilla um, right. yeah. Yeah, if you could just, I know it's a pretty um, <laughs> in-depth topic, but maybe we could just touch on it briefly, um, the psychological aspect of BDSM. You just think I touched on it briefly, but just if you could kind of just take it, just, you know, not too in-depth, of course, for sake of time, but just a little bit um, on just the psychological aspect of it. Absolutely. So I suppose, like, a uh, good way to... Um, uh, see that is I will speak on my own experience and what's great about BDSM so there's a DS dynamic which is dominant and submissive and they are all so incredibly nuanced and everybody likes something a little different and so for me um, being a submissive is so liberating um, I can be saying yes sir thank you mistress for the punishment and following orders to the letter and for me not having to make a decision in that moment and, and giving up that control it's I'm free you know I don't have to think about it all the time I let that go and it's a, it's almost like a psychological orgasm is the best way I could possibly describe it it gives you a sense of freedom and it may be somebody's alter ego or whatever it is but truthfully it is my most authentic self i would say you know it's a part of that person and it can either be just a fun every once in a while or it can be a 24 7 where they follow the protocols the boundaries everything all the time um so for me it's not 24 7 but when I'm in those scenes, um, psychologically um, and emotionally, I'm able to let go and not be so controlling because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a control freak in my life. And so for those like beautiful, blissful moments, I don't have to be in control. And also the um, 
psychological bond between the dominant and submissive is like almost soul melding, like they're merging their souls together. And in something called subspace, um, it's where all thoughts leave. It's like this blissful transcendent space that some submissives go into where they just, they feel nothing but what's happening to them. And tops or dominants can go into top space in a different way. But the psychology with it is, um, it brings you to a different place than you would be in your everyday life. And it gives you a sense of completeness in whatever way your dynamic is, the power dynamic. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about um, something that always kind of comes to mind is, you know, I kind of believe um, everybody kind of has like a a sexual personality where it's kind of like either exactly the way they are all the time or it's like the exact opposite. Do you find that in in that people who play um, different roles or whatnot, would you say, if you can, maybe it would be hard to really kind of differentiate, but would you say the majority of people are kind of the Christian Grey type, you know, he's that way all the time, or people who are like the total opposite, you know what I'm saying, like people who, people who are, um, maybe played the submissive role, I know sometimes they're like your CEOs and your executives who make decisions all the time, they want to get rid of that and play the opposite, so we just say the majority of the people are, um, their role is pretty much how they are all the time, or do you find more people kind of looking to escape and be the opposite of how they normally are? that makes sense honestly it completely varies from person to person one thing that i found is that um some people in positions of power or control for instance somebody in the army or marine you know that has to be like in control all the time and can't make any mistakes tend to go towards more of the submissive side so they don't have to feel that then again it also may just translate and they feel comfortable as a dominant. So it on it, it's so varied that it's, it's almost impossible to say if it's the majority for me, there's something called a service submissive, which is you like to be of service to your top or other people like here, like getting them a drink or folding their laundry or whatever it is that translates to my personal life. Even when I'm not in a sexual situation, um, but generally, the sexual side of it, I would probably say translates in a scene to outside of a scene. It's really where you feel the most comfortable. But the statistics on it are, are pretty much impossible to determine because everybody's so different. Right, yeah, I kind of <laughs> imagine that. I just now have seen um, yeah. a lot of, um, I watch a lot of videos, read a lot of articles, and pretty much any, a lot of early depictions I've seen. and media would not have typically been um like i said your high-powered men attorneys lawyers would uh whatever you know, executives and so on and so forth um being going to the dominatrix and getting you know smacked around or whatever it is you're into you know just to sort of uh, yeah. they will they want they want to get rid of that stress that position of power and decision making like you said and just kind of play that different roles so i was kind of wondering you know yeah it's, all, it's a place. stress release no matter what position they transition into it's a stress reliever you know you're able to let go so yeah but absolutely for sure and so you just say um communication is something i talk about a lot in my videos it just always comes up <laughs> so that's yeah. important in relationships um the communication is really a big part of it isn't it something that people don't realize it's almost it's all it yeah it's almost all of it is communication i mean you cannot play without communication it's it's almost impossible because not only is it dangerous to play without communication if you don't talk especially beforehand in what we call negotiations to figure out what's okay what's not okay what you want what you don't want yeah. um without communication you're you can't read each other's minds you know just like in the regular world in relationships if they're in sex you know it's it's just i remember having some you know my girl talk and some of my friends came home from like a one night stand or even with their boyfriends whatever and they were i was like so how was the sex and she's just like, eh, it really wasn't great. And I'm like, why? And she says that he didn't do what she wanted. And I'm like, well, did you tell him what you wanted? She's like, no. 
I'm like, you know, and I'm just, that is the problem. You know, it's communicating exactly what you want and desire is how you can achieve that. Um, and especially in BDSM. And what's cool about that is even if you find out BDSM is not really your jam, it so helps in your relationships um, at work, uh, your partner, significant other, your friendships, just learning how to communicate and set boundaries and follow through, it translates to your life no matter what. So absolutely, communication is a huge part of playing. Right, yeah. So yeah, I always see that kind of dynamic and hear people who participate in it to kind of talk about that. And just, it really just always stuck out to me because I feel like, you know, whether you kind of want to, you know, experiment with it or not, it's just, there's, there's just so much, many more dynamics to it than what people um, that typically expect. And also, I um, wanted to ask, you know, of course, where some places are now kind of, you know, lifting the um, stay at home orders or whatnot. We're seeing some businesses going, opening back up and whatnot. But um, for those who are still um, quarantined, especially entire couples and maybe with their, <laughs> their kids and their parents and in-laws, whatever else, just in general, from um, the couples that are still quarantined, what's um, them obviously not having the access to maybe like go to some of the events or, you know, socialize with it so much. But maybe let's say, you know, you have a couple at home right now that's under quarantine, has been for the past few months. They're looking to um, explore, maybe not just BDSM, but anything right now, really, but BDSM, BDSM in particular, I guess, how would, um, would you recommend for people in that situation right now, kind of wanting to branch out and explore a little bit under the quarantine? Absolutely. Well, what's great about it is you don't need a dungeon to explore BDSM. You don't need whips and chains. You can absolutely substitute those for anything else. If you want some bondage, a tie, a scarf, um, even like underwear or a shirt and just tying that, you know, it's, you don't need chains for that. It's bondage, you know, and for any, anybody who's want to experience pain play, whether severe or really light, um, a belt works or even a spatula from your kitchen or a ruler or whatever that is. Um, so you don't need like the specific toys um, that you typically associate with BDSM. Any really, you can find a household item truly. And then also, let's say you want to just experience role play. You don't need a special outfit, you know, it's you're just channeling your imagination into it. You can be a schoolgirl or, you know, a altar boy or whatever. You just use your imagination and figure out the dialogue. And be, so BDSM is, is easily achievable. Um, uh, when you can find like what you, what you have access to and it can be, you know, it's cool because, you know, with this quarantine going on, you know, I haven't been able to go to dungeons and I have a few play partners that I play with. So not being able to do that, like with my significant other, we were able to, um, uh, wrap um he attached like these cuffs that I have or even scarves to a belt underneath my ottoman and made it a spanking bench mm. like he just MacGyvered it and made it like right. a spanking bench out of nothing you know yeah. and so and it's you know it's fun and it it brings you to this different world and you don't you don't think about the fact that you can't leave your house you know you're in a totally separate world just together um and it's fun and it's frisky and you know so it's easily achievable you don't need a big wooden structure or a dungeon to be able to do that yeah well it sounds like it'd be a good way for um couples in general but especially right now to really kind of um reconnect and just like you said get out of their heads get out of their space and just kind of feel like they're um kind of outside of their um limited structures for now because i know a lot of people are just of course going stir crazy and whatnot just people yeah. still, i've gone to work every day still you know i work in direct health care so i you know essential i can't stay home as much as part of me would have liked to but at the same time i'm out there like a week i probably would have been over it ready to go back to so I think it yeah, sounds like a really um, a good way for really um, some couples like us to reconnect and kind of just um, get out of their, their spaces a bit. And I kind of want to ask you one more thing real quick, um, a more um, general question. Um, there's been a lot of research um, 
not as fast. I think a few years or so really about um, the younger people, which I guess that could be, I don't know, maybe it's people my generation, millennials, but I think it's particularly um, the, the centennials, the generation after me. Uh, a lot of reports showing that they're having less sex um, and less going on less dates and whatnot. And so I kind of wanted to get, um, not sure that's something you've been really into a lot, but just kind of wanted to know what um, your thoughts on that are and the reasons you think that might be. For the, like, on sex, dating, and relationships and such, like the current state of it all? Yeah, just the current state in general of sex and relationships right now, but particularly why I think yeah, well, people have been lost. Yeah, so obviously, um, if you can't reach, so let's say you're on like Hinge or Tinder, obviously you shouldn't meet that person that, you know, with the quarantine and everything. Mm -hmm. But something that, um, so it's, of course, that proves a challenge uh, with that lack of physical intimacy if you're, you know, building something with somebody else. Um, but I saw this adorable video on Facebook and it was this guy and this girl and they, um, you know, they lived in buildings right across from each other and he saw her dancing on her rooftop from his balcony and he's like, I gotta know this girl. So he sent like this drone with his phone number to her like rooftop mm -hmm. and they ended up having, um, a date in which they both set up a table on her rooftop on his balcony and they waved to each other and also had FaceTime date. Mm -hmm. um, and what's kind of cool about that is people don't, act, people didn't do that, you know, before quarantine. And it yeah. almost reminds me of high school, you know, before you were allowed to date. Right. Um, and so it's to bring, it's a different kind of intimacy for sure. Um, and it's, you know, without, like, with the lack of physical intimacy, just focusing on, you know, the romantic intimacy or building a bond and stepping out of the physical, it can bring a whole new aspect to a possible relationship. And also, you know, if you're able to live with your partner or whatever that is and have sex, if you quarantine properly, um, it's fun because it's a little more sporadic maybe. And it's almost like you're just starting over again. You know, it's just like, it's almost new again. And it brings that fun, like, giddy feeling like when you've just started dating somebody so you know it's for people who are younger like let's say my little cousin for people who are younger and they can't like actually meet new people like in their teenagers or whatever um mm -hmm. it's it goes back to that you know and then and then also uh with sex um, you can try Skype sex, you know, or whatever platform you're using, and it's really hot and totally different thing, you know, like let's say mutual masturbation or, you know, dirty talk. It brings this different aspect that you wouldn't really achieve when you're just in person. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, you know, of course it proves its challenges, the quarantine with sex dating and relationships, but it allows us to try something new that we probably wouldn't have before. Absolutely, yeah. So not to cut it short, but of course I know you had some plans later on, and um, I set the video to like 30 minutes, and I don't want to cut us off, so I just wanted to finish it properly. Um, but yeah. somebody can um, find you online if they want to connect with you. Well, um, my website is unfortunately down right now, but it should be up. It's coachedbybarbara.com. And another way you can find me is on FetLife. Uh, it's basically Facebook for kinky people. Um, it's my username is tiemeupsir27. And then also you can just email me at barbara.handle at yahoo.com. And I'm more than happy to respond and to help you wherever I can. And I do Skype sessions as well for my sex coaching. So I am more than available to help. Well, sounds great. I want to thank you for being here. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, of course, I'll link your information when I post the videos. And um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. You get to listen to somebody else besides me. For once. <laughs> I know I enjoy that. Thank you guys so much for listening and thank you so much for having me. Thank you.